He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 28 Public Enemy When news spread of the battle between the mysterious Supergirl and the Danver City Police, the Justice League had many questions for Superman. Clark explained that Kara had not been on Earth for more than a couple of months. Overall, the team was sympathetic and quick to forgive him, yet Batman held reservations. I appreciate that you actually knew to keep her a secret, but I shouldn't be surprised that you brought her to a party. I'd hope you'd consult me before making decisions that direct the course of global events. Clark hoped this phrasing was hyperbole, though it proved to be an understatement. President Luther had seized the moment and made a point of acting on his campaign promises. Within days, he mounted an assault on the Hall of Justice. Task Force X was assigned to occupy the building and take the League into custody. The prior evening, with Diana's help, Colonel Steve Trevor covertly visited the Hall of Justice. They came to warn them, finding the team already midway through a meeting. The core members of the Justice League had been gathering that night. Superman, The Flash, Green Arrow, Martian Manhunter, The Green Lantern, and a holographic projection of Batman attending through his own satellite connection. Wonder Woman's late arrival put everyone to silence as Colonel Trevor told the League of Luther's plans and their imminent doom. Oliver, The Green Arrow, suggested giving Luther a fight. I'm not saying we should be here when they arrive, but I think some proper booby traps are in order. John Stewart, the Green Lantern, scoffed at this suggestion. How long do you plan to stay here setting up your traps? Don't be ridiculous. Oliver frowned. He missed the banter from when Hal Jordan was Green Lantern. Instead, the Flash jumped in to riff off of Oliver. I could set up some booby traps in a few seconds. Clark had to hold back a chuckle. He appreciated Barry's levity, but this moment called for some leadership. No booby traps. We aren't at war with whatever unwitting soldiers they send. John Stewart cleared his throat. Thank you, Superman. As I was saying, we have to assume they're on their way now, or already outside. Wonder Woman stood up, taking this as a call to action. If they are here now, then they'll receive the fight they came for. Clark glanced around the area, looking through the walls of all the nearby buildings. There were no attackers within miles. No further arguments were needed. They locked the Hall of Justice's computer systems and slipped away into the night, keeping the lights on and leaving the Javelin 17 behind as a decoy. The Justice League spent the night preparing their members for what was to come. Using his ring, John Stewart made a hypersonic jet that was even more advanced than the Javelin 17. From the jet, John Jones sent an initial warning. He reached out telepathically to everyone in the League who missed the debriefing. Mr. Terrific, Vixen, and the Atom kept no secrets about their identities and had no alter egos. The Flash ran ahead on foot to get Ray Palmer, the Atom. Ray kept a shrunken bug-out bag packed and ready to go at all times. It included an enormous number of storage containers within storage containers of supplies that the League would need while on the run. Michael Holt, better known as Mr. Terrific, was torn up about leaving his own headquarters. It was the hub of his operations. Like Batman, he was without powers, but possessed the intelligence to invent an arsenal of tools for himself. Mari Jiwe, Vixen, was just as reluctant. She had to leave behind modeling work to join the League. Jefferson Pierce decided he would stay where he was with his family and stop going out as Black Lightning altogether. This would be his early retirement. Dinah, the Black Canary, also chose to stay behind in Starling, preferring to attend to Roy as he recovered from his recent surgeries. The last member contacted was Clark's cousin, Arthur. Jean Jones could not easily reach Atlantis telepathically. They had to land along the coastline so that Jean Jones could submerge himself in the sea. Arthur could have stayed in his own kingdom, a realm intentionally separated from humanity, yet he chose to join his friends in their time of need. When Aquaman arose from the surf, 
He seemed larger than Clark remembered. Taking his cousin into a full embrace, he noticed that Arthur had the beginning of a beard and his voice had become deeper. Hey cuz, how you doing? Let's do this! Together, in the glowing green jet that Jon Stewart continued to will into existence, they flew to Clark's family home in the Arctic. When they arrived, Batman, Robin, and Nightwing stood outside of the Crystal Palace wearing insulated layers with their usual supersuits. The enormous doors of the palace had already swung open, anticipating the arrival of Kal-El and his friends. The Justice League entered in absolute awe. None of them but the Flash had seen this place before. Clark led them across the main hall and to the doorway to the left of the altar, bringing them to the plush room he and Barry had first discovered together. Oliver, as usual, was the first to exclaim, What the? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Look at this place. Why did we even bother to build the Hall of Justice? Mari Jiwe didn't need more than a half a second to answer Oliver's question. The temperature outside is enough reason for me. Nightwing saw it both ways. It's pretty deluxe, but I'm not gonna lie. This is one hell of a commute. We had to walk in from the coast to hide the Batwing. It startled Clark to realize this. Jason was rather young to be marching through the snow. Bruce asked a lot of him. Looking at the boy, Clark found he was difficult to read. His adolescent face was already hardening into a grimace. Only occasionally, while talking to Nightwing, did Clark notice this young Robin show any expression at all. Once the initial awe of seeing the palace had settled, Ray Palmer wanted to get straight to business. Do all of the rooms here have squishy floors? Because we need to unpack, and I need some ground that's a little more stable than this for my lab. I don't think so. This is the only one, as far as I know. Barry jumped at the opportunity to help. Here, I'll give you the tour. I've been in more than a couple of the rooms here. With the Flash's aid, Ray's portable laboratory was operational even before Task Force X arrived at the Hall of Justice. Bursting through the doors, the Suicide Squad found the Hall abandoned. Within minutes of the raid, Luther decreed the Justice League to be enemies of the state. Though they all knew this was coming, hearing the announcement stirred a new tension amongst the League. They had been quick to forgive Clark when he first told them about Kara. Becoming criminals overnight soured that sense of forgiveness. While they were slowly regrouping in the plush round living room, Jon Stewart confronted Superman directly. Where is this Supergirl anyway? If she's so much of a problem, why isn't she here with us? She's just a kid who got in over her head. I have her safe where she is. But she's a Kryptonian like you, right? Maybe we should find out what kind of Kryptonian she is. She's no fighter, even if she has powers. Like I said, she's just a kid. There's no point in putting her through this. Jon Stewart's voice rose slightly in volume. I'd like to believe you, but maybe you're protecting her. All I want to do is have us confirm it for ourselves. Perhaps you can explain to us, one more time, why you kept her as a secret. I never thought of her as a secret. How could you not? Diana joined the conversation. Having listened from the start, Kalel would do no such thing. It's not in his nature. Clark was grateful she stepped in. He had been grasping for some defense of his actions. Thank you, Diana. Diana turned sharply to face Clark. Unfortunately, Kalel, in this same way, you are inherently reluctant to act. Just like this room, you tend to be too soft, saying nothing and doing nothing in the hopes that your troubles will resolve themselves. Clark was caught speechless by this scathing assessment. Entering from the hallway, Barry heard Diana and immediately spoke in Clark's defense. Now hold on there. Sometimes a part of being the guy with the most power is knowing when to use it. Timing is everything. Jon Stewart called the conversation back to himself. Thank you, Flash, but we're talking about information here. Information Superman could have easily shared. There's literally no excuse for neglecting to tell the League about this girl. She's obviously a danger we should be keeping an eye on. Clark had to consciously make an effort to keep his voice leveled. There's no need for that. Stewart took a step closer to Superman, hands on his hips. Are you sure? Because it seems to me like it's too late to do otherwise. Arthur reluctantly joined in. Whoa, bro. Dial it back a bit. I think you're blowing this up more than we need to. And I think you don't understand the gravity of our situation. Batman cut the argument short. Clark hadn't even noticed him come back into the room. As much as I don't like our situation here, 
I'm not going to start blaming a child. Luther's been a ticking time bomb for years and this was just a catalyst he could use for his agenda. Bickering amongst ourselves will accomplish nothing. As hard as it may be sometimes, I'm learning to trust Superman. You should too. Before the conversation could turn back on Clark, Batman went on with business. I'm going back to Starling tonight with the boys. We're going to retrieve the Javelin 17 so that Stuart doesn't have to keep carrying everyone around. Oliver leapt at this opportunity. Do you have another seat in that thing, Bats? I'm thinking I might be better off helping Roy along with Canary. Besides, I'd love to help you steal back our jet. John Stewart objected. And where in the Arctic are we planning to land a jet that won't be visible to anyone looking for us? Barry had an upbeat answer to John Stewart's rhetorical question. I found a hangar bay while exploring. The old javel totally fit. This was astonishing news, especially for Clark, who blurted out, A hangar bay? Here? Um, mostly, yeah. I don't know what else we'd use it for. At the furthest end of the passageway where Ray had unpacked their new base of operations was a massive empty space with a hard, smooth floor and a massive horizontal door. Clark had to agree. It was best described as a hangar bay. It was the perfect spot for the Javelin 17. Its doors were so large that their opening lifted a section of the mountain from which the Crystal Palace emerged from. As promised, Batman, Robin, and Nightwing's heist to steal the jet from the Hall of Justice went as well as could be hoped for, and the hangar bay at the Crystal Palace fit both the Javelin 17 and the Batwing. Clark was glad to see Jason wouldn't be forced to trudge through the snow again. Even with their hypersonic jet back in their possession, there was little the Justice League could do while on the run from the US government. Luther's xenophobic message was contagious around the world. For the first few days, the Justice League remained silent in their Arctic hiding place. The Crystal Palace was by no means a place for humans to live. This did nothing to stop Ray Palmer from setting himself to making the palace a second home. He created a kitchen and dining room along with an elaborate laboratory. Ray even kept a luxurious bathroom inside of one of his tiny capsules. Mr. Terrific was especially grateful to have a base of operations. He didn't have all of his custom gear there, but Michael was inspired to finally work alongside the famous Ray Palmer. The two of them shared the excitement of boys who'd gone off to summer camp. Mari Jiwe was far less excited to be there, eventually opting to go back to her village in Zambezi. Clark flew her to her hometown in Africa where they originally met. Seeing that he was reluctant to leave, Mari gently lay her hand on his shoulder. Let us go for a walk, Clark. There is a tree I want to see before sunset. Though, maybe you should transform yourself into something less conspicuous? She gave Clark a wry wink. In a flash, he turned himself back into Clark Kent, still wearing his work attire and glasses. Mari laughed. This is not as subtle a look as I would have hoped, but it will do. She checked in with him as they walked along the dirt road. Tell me, Clark Kent, how are you handling all this? I know you are not as impervious as you look. How are you holding up? Clark reflected inward, searching for an answer. They slowed down as his feet began to drag. When he waited too long to speak up, Mari gave him a light reprimand. Look at you. Lift your feet as you walk. You are kicking up dust. Clark looked behind him at the dirt he had sent blowing through the air. He concentrated on lifting his feet with each step. Mari could not stop herself from laughing as they walked. Now what are you doing? You are walking like a clown. Stop. You need to walk normally. You know, normal human walking. You know how to do that, right? Clark went from being self-conscious at dragging his feet to being self-aware of the absurd way in which he was lifting them. This awareness shifted so quickly he was brought to tears of laughter. He and Mari struggled to walk the path as they hunched over in hysterics. The crippling laughter led them both to walk without coordination and further incited them into tears. When they made it to the tree that Mari sought, they were barely beginning to catch their breath. It was a very old tree standing alone in the grass. The two of them sat with their backs to it and took in the view. Mari, again, encouraged Clark to open up. If you would like to try again, you are free to drag your feet while we sit here. Thanks, but I think dragging my feet has been the problem all along. And when I stop dragging my feet, well, I just start walking funny. I mean metaphorically. Mari stifled her laughter. Yes, yes, Clark, I know. But please, maybe we should find a different metaphor. 
You are going to crack me up again if I have to picture you walking like that. It would be the perfect metaphor, if only it were actually as funny in reality. If we must stick to this analogy, you just have to let yourself walk naturally. You do it all the time. Yeah, well, that's just it. I thought I was walking naturally, and look where it brought us. I'm starting to doubt myself, no matter what direction I move in. I can see why you are hesitant, but there is nothing wrong with holding still and appreciating the view. We all need to reset sometimes. Clark couldn't agree more. The two of them sat by the tree as the sun slowly set. It helped clear his mind, yet it was hard for him to believe he could afford to hold still, metaphorically speaking. There were still so many unknowns ahead. The Justice League's fugitive status did nothing to lessen any need for them around the world. Yet covertly maintaining a global presence from the Arctic was not such a simple task. When they held a meeting to discuss logistics, Barry Allen was the first to call out what everyone had been avoiding bringing up. Look, most of us have maintained secret identities on our own for years. This is nothing new, so nothing should be holding us back from returning to our mild-mannered lives. I'm sure I can make a bigger difference at home being the Flash a fraction of the time than trying to do it from here. Arthur rolled onto his side, laying on the plush floor. Look, my dudes, I'll be real with you. I have an entire undersea kingdom to attend to, and I don't have to worry about any kind of secret identity there, so I'm not going to hang here much longer. And I totally wouldn't blame any of you for wanting to go back to your lives. Ray Palmer, who could not return to his prominent position at Ivy University, chuckled. I imagine if Batman were here, he'd give us all a big I told you so about keeping a secret identity. Michael Holt dismissed the concern. I don't care what Bat says. I've got no regrets. I'm going to make the best out of this situation. Michael turned to Ray. Are there any experiments you want to work on? It looks like it'll just be you and me here. Jean Jones spoke up to remind them. I myself have done nothing to maintain an alter ego for many years now, and have no relations on Earth besides all of you. I will stay here with you and make myself available where needed. Glad to have you, Jean. It looks like that just leaves us one question. Clark went ahead and asked, What's that? Who's gonna do our first shopping run? Because we could really use some fresh food. Clark assured him, I'll take care of that. Just write up a shopping list. It was settled. Everyone in the Justice League who had an alias went back to their lives part-time. Ray Palmer, Michael Holt, and John Jones remained in the Arctic and relied on Clark and the others for their basic supplies of food and toiletries. They were especially agreeable, considering their circumstances, and put themselves to making a functional base for the team to operate from. Spread out as they were, the League had little use for such a remote location. As the Flash had suggested, most of the hero work they did was close to their homes. During this time, Clark would not give up on the refugees still caught in the war. Even without the coordination of an international coalition, he continued to enter the battle-entrenched nations to save civilians at risk. Unfortunately, his and the League's assistance there created new risks. When he escorted refugees, the coalition armies ignored him. Yet the moment Superman was not accompanied by these civilians, he found himself under attack. At first, Clark was unsure where these attacks were coming from. Fire rained down on him from the sky in the form of some kind of ray beam. Clark discovered he could dodge the ray beams, yet that did nothing to stop them from coming down near the inhabited areas below. These areas were already war-torn. Beams of fire from space seemed a step too far for Clark. He launched himself skyward, taking a deep breath before entering the thermosphere. The attack was coming from a coalition satellite, unsurprisingly made by LexCorp. For a moment, Clark wanted to destroy the thing, but doing so would only perpetuate Luther's claim that he was a threat. Instead of destroying these satellites, Clark found himself spending less time helping refugees along the battlefront. Yet it wasn't just the European war arena that Luther unleashed his satellite weaponry on Superman. Should he save anyone, in any situation, anywhere, and stay for long, he would find himself targeted from above when he was through. One evening, Clark felt especially exasperated after several of these satellite attacks. He told Martha and Kara about it over dinner. Kara thought the solution was simple. Why don't you just destroy the satellites? Clark shook his head. It's not a problem I want to settle with force. I'm sure I could have everything go my way all the time if I wanted, but I prefer finding more subtle solutions. And I have no doubt, 
If I destroy any of his satellites, it'll only speed him along with making something worse. After dinner, while leaving Smallville, Clark remembered he needed to pick up some supplies for the others at the Crystal Palace. Spotting a small grocery store from above, Clark landed and discreetly transformed himself into his work clothes. He didn't know the layout of the store, but scanned through the aisles of shelving to find what he was looking for. When he completed his shopping, he couldn't help overhear the banter at the register. There was a consensus, it seemed, between the checkers and the customers. Luther's been warning us for years. I didn't want to believe him at first, but at this point, it's hard to deny. I'm telling you, we're all in trouble. Whatever Superman's scheming, we couldn't stop him if we wanted to. They all agreed that Superman was not to be trusted. Clark wanted no part in their conversation, buying his groceries and leaving without comment. As he flew north, Clark considered Mari Jiwe's parting wisdom. It was time he held still, metaphorically speaking. The very next day, he requested a sabbatical from the Daily Planet. This war insisted on burning with or without Superman in the Justice League. Clark hoped the conflict would extinguish itself while he retreated to the Arctic to wait it all out. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Son of L is written and produced by myself. This story means so much to me and I want to share it with as many ears as possible. Please talk about it, recommend it, rate and review it. And if you can, please become a patron at patreon.com slash bluefoot. I plan to see this story through. How fast that happens may be up to you. I appreciate any support you can offer. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. With additional contributions by Otto Binder, Al Plastino, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Robert Kaniger, Ross Andrew, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peter, Carmine Infantino, Mort Weisinger, George Papp, Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams, Tony Isabella, Trevor Von Eden, John Ostrander, Tom Mandrake, Jerry Conway, Bob Oxner, Julius Schwartz, Gardner Fox, Gil Kane, Tony Isabella, Trevor Von Eden, Paul Norris, Dick Dillon, George Papp, and Don Newton. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Blue Dot Sessions, Poddington Bear, Kyle Preston, Jazar, Vortex, and Till Pardiso. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. Easy storytelling with immersive results. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 29, Lost Places.